the Lancashire Witches Chapter 4, the male diction, the captive ecclesiastics, together with the strong escort by which they were attended, under the command of John Bradle, the High Sheriff of the County, had passed the previous night at Whitewell in Bolden Forest, and the abbot, before setting out on his final journey, was permitted to spend an hour in prayer in a little chapel on an adjoining hill, overlooking a most picturesque portion of the forest, the beauties of which were enhanced by the windings of the Hodder, one of the loveliest streams in Lancashire. His devotions performed, Haslew, attended by a guard, slowly descended the hill, and gazed his last on scene familiar to him almost from infancy. Noble trees, which now looked like old friends, to whom he was bidding an eternal adore, stood around him. Beneath them, at the end of a glade, couched a herd of deer, which started off at sight of the intruders, and made him envy their freedom and fleetness, as he followed them in through to their solitude. At the foot of a steep rock ran the hodder, making pleasant music of other days, as he dashed over his heavily bed, recalling times when, free from all care, he had stayed by its woodring bank to listen to the pleasant sound of running waters, and watch the shining pebbles beneath them, and the swift trout and dainty umber glancing past. A bitter pang was it to part with scenes so fair, and the abbot spoke no word, not even looked up until passing little mitten. He came in sight of Woolly Abbey, then collecting all his energies, he bared for his shock he was about to endure. But nerved as he was, his firmness was sorely tried, when he beheld the stately pile, once his own, now gone from him, and is forever. He gave one fond glance towards it, and then painfully averting his gaze, recited in a low voice this supplication, Misery re me das, secundum magnam misericordium tuum, et secundum multitudium miserationum turum dele iniquitum emcum amplius lava me ab iniquit mea et e pesato mio munda me. But other thoughts and other emotions crowded upon him when he beheld the groups of his old retainers advancing to meet him. Men, women, and children pouring forth loud lamentations, prostrating themselves at his feet and deploring his doom. The abbot's fortune had a severe trial here, and the tears sprang to his eyes. The devotion of these poor people touched him more sharply than the severity of his adversaries. Bless ye, bless ye, my children, he cried. Repine not for me, for I bear my cross with resignation. It is for me to bewail your lot, much fearing that what I have so long and so zealously tendered will fall into the hands of other and less heedful pastors, or still worse, of devouring wolves. Bless ye, my children, and be comforted. Think of the end of Abbot Haslew, and for what he suffered. Think that he was a traitor to the king, and took up arms in rebellion against him, cried the sheriff, riding up and speaking in a loud voice, and that for his heinous offences he was justly condemned to death. Murmurs arose at this speech, but they were instantly checked by the escort. Think charitably of me, my children, said Abbot, and the blessed virgin keep you steadfast in your faith. Then a decide, be silent, traitor, I command thee, cried the sheriff, striking him with his gauntlet in the face. The abbot's pale cheek burnt crimson, and his eyes flashed fire, but he controlled himself and answered meekly, Thou didst not speak in such wise, John Bradle, when I say thee from the blood, which blood thou thyself caused to burst forth by devilish acts, rejoining the sheriff, I owe thee little for the service. If for no else, thou deservest death for thy evil doings on that night. The abbot made no reply, for Bradle's allusion conjured up a sombre train of thought within his breast, awakening apprehensions which he could neither account for nor shake off. Meanwhile, cavalcade slowly approached the northeast gateway of the abbey, passing through crowds of kneeling and sorrowing bystanders. But so deeply was the abbot engrossed by the one dread idea that possessed him, that he saw them not, and scarce heard their woeful lamentation. All at once the cavalcade stopped, and the sheriff rode on to the gate, in the opening of which some ceremony was observed. Then it was that Paslo raised his eyes, and beheld standing before him a tall man with a woman beside him, bearing an infant in her arms. The eyes of the pair were fixed upon him with vindictive exultation. He would have averted his gaze, but an irresistible fascination withheld him. Thou seest all is paired, said Endai, coming close to the mule on which Paslo was mounted, and pointing to the gigantic gallows looming above the abbey walls. Wilt thou now accede to my request? And then he added significantly, on the same terms as before, the abbot understood his meaning well. Life and freedom were offered him by a being whose power to accomplish his promise he did not doubt. The struggle was hard, but he resisted the temptation, and answered firmly no. Then die the felon death thou emeritus, cried Bess fiercely, and I will glut mine eyes with the spectacle, incense beyond endurance. The abbot looked sternly at her, and raised his hand in denunciation. The action and the look were so appalling that the frightened woman would have fled if her husband had not restrained her. By the holy patriarchs and prophets, by the prelates and confessors, by the doctors of the church, by the holy abbots, monks, and eremites who dwelt in solitudes, in mountains, and in caverns, by the holy saints and martyrs who suffered torture and death for their faith. I curse thee, which cried Haslow. May the malediction of heaven and all its hosts alight on the head of thy 
fighting them. Oh, holy abbot shrieked Bess, breaking from her husband and flinging herself at Haslow's feet. Curse me if thou wilt but spare my innocent child. Save it and we will save thee. Avoid thee, wretch and impious woman, rejoined the abbot. I have pronounced the dread anathema and it cannot be recalled. Look at the dripping garments of the child. In blood has it been baptized and through blood stained path shall its course be taken. Ha, shrieked Bess, noticing for the first time and sanguine condition of the infant's attire. Covert blood all. Oh, listen to me, wicked woman, pursued the abbot, as if filled with a prophetic spirit. Thy child's life shall be long beyond the ordinary term of a woman, but it shall be a life of war and ill. Oh, say him, say him, or I shall die, cried Bess. But the wizard could not see a great power than his own apparently overmastered him. Children shall she have, continued the abbot, and children's children, but they shall be a race doomed and a curse, a brood of adders, that the world shall flee from and crush. A thing accursed and shunned by her fellows shall thy daughter be evil, reputed and evil doing, no hand to help her, no lip to bless her, life a burden, and death long, long in coming, binding her in a dismal dungeon, now apart from me, and trouble me no more. Bess made a motion as if she would go, and then turning partly round, dropped heavily on the ground. Them die, caught the child, here she fell. Thou hast killed her, he cried to the abbot, a stronger voice than man have spoken, if it be so, rejoined Paslo. Fuge, miserim, fuge, male vice, queer, judes, ades, erratus. At this moment, the trumpet again sounded. The cavalcade being put in motion, the abbot and his fellow captives passed through the gate. Dismounting from their mules within the court before the chapter house, the captive ecclesiastics, preceded by the sheriff, were led to the principal chamber of the structure, where the Earl of Derby awaited them, seated in the gothic carved oak chair, formerly occupied by the abbots of Warley on the occasion of conferences or elections. The Earl was surrounded by his officers, and the chamber was filled with armed men. The abbot slowly advanced towards the Earl. His deportment was dignified and firm, even majestic. The exultation of spirit occasioned by the interview with M. Dark and his wife had passed away and was succeeded by a profound calm. The view of his cheek was livid, but otherwise he seemed wholly unmoved. The ceremony of delivering up bodies of the prisoners to the Earl was gone through by the sheriff and their sentences were then read aloud by a clerk. After this, the Earl, who had hitherto remained covered, took off his hat and in a solemn voice spoke. John Paslo, some while abbot of Warley, but now an attainted and condemned felon, and John Eastgate and William Haydock, formerly brethren of the same monastery and confessed with him in crime. We have heard your doom. Tomorrow you shall die the ignominious death of traitors. For the king in his mercy have been regarded not so much through the heinous nature of your offences towards his sovereign majesty as to the sacred offices you once held, and of which you have been shamefully deprived. is graciously pleased to remit a part of your sentence, whereby ye are condemned to be quartered alive, willing that the hearts which conceive so much malice and violence against him should cease to beat within your own bosoms, and that the arms which were raised in rebellion against him should be interred in one common grave with the trunks to which they belong. Heaven save the high and pure Iceland King Henry the Eighth, and free him from all traitors, cried the clerk. We humbly thank his majesty for his clemency, said the abbot, amid the profound silence that ensured. And I pray you, my good lord, when you shall write to the king concerning us, to say to his majesty that we died penitent of many and grave offences, amongst the which is chiefly that of having taken arms unlawfully against him, but that that we did solely with a view of freeing his highness from evil counsellors and of re-establishing our holy church for the which we would willingly die if our death might in any wise profit it. Amen, exclaimed Father Eastgate, who stood with his hands crossed upon his breast, close behind Paslo. The abbot hath uttered my sentiments, he hath not uttered mine, cried Father Hadar. I ask no grace from the bloody Herodias, and will accept none. What I have done, I will do again. Were the past to return, nay, I would do more. I would find a way to reach the tyrant's heart and thus free our church from its worst enemy, and the land from the ruthless oppressor. Remove him, said the Earl, the vile traitor shall be dealt with as he merits. For you, he added, as the order was obeyed, and addressing the other prisoners, and especially you, John Paslow, who have shown some compunction for your crimes, and to prove to you that the king is not a ruthless tyrant he have been just represented. I hereby in his name promise you any boon which you may ask consistently with your situation. What favour would you have shown you? The abbot reflected for a moment to speak thou, John Eastgate, said the Earl of Derby, seeing that the abbot was occupied in court. If I may pre-offer a request, my lord, replied the monk, it is that our poor distraught brother, William Haydock, he spared watering block. He meant not what he said. Well, be it as thou wilt, replied the Earl, bending his brows. Though he 
ill deserves such grace. Now John has flu, which would have thou thus addressed the abbot Luttrell, I would have made the same request as my brother John E. Say, if he had not anticipated me, my lord, said Haslow, but since his petition is granted, I would on my own part entreat that mass he said for us in the Colvin church. Many of the brethren are without the abbey, and if permitted will assist at its performance. I know not if I shall incur the king's displeasure in the sentence by the earl of Derby after a little reflection, but I will hazard it. Mass for the dead shall be said in the church at midnight, and all the brethren who choose to come thither shall be permitted to assist at it. They will attend, I doubt not, for it will be the last time the rites of the Roman church formed in those walls. They shall have all required for the ceremonial. Heaven's blessing on you, my lord, said the abbot, will first pledge me your sacred word, said the earl, by the holy office you once held, and by the saints in whom you trust, that this concession shall not be made the means for any attempt at flight. I swear it, replied the abbot earnestly, and I also swear it, added Father Isia. Enough, said the earl, I will give the necessary orders. Notice of the celebration of mass at midnight shall be claimed without the abbey. Now remove the prisoners upon this the captive ecclesiastics were led forth. Father Isia was taken to a strong room in the lower part of the chapter house, where all acts of discipline had been formed by the monks, and where the knotted lash, the spiked girdle, and the hair shirt had once hung. While the abbot was conveyed to his old chamber, which had been prepared for his reception, and there left alone. Chapter 5 The Midnight Mass Soulfully sounds the old sound bell from the tower of the Covenant Church. The bell is one of five, and has obtained the name because it is told only for those about to pass away from life. Now it rings the knell of three souls to depart on the morrow. Brightly illuminated is a vein within which no taper had gleamed since the old worship ceased, showing that preparations are made for the last service. The organ, dumb so long, breathes a low prelude. Sad is it to hear that knell sad to view those gloriously dyed pains, and to think why the one rings and the other is lighted up. Dolefully sounds a bell, and two beers covered with howls are borne slowly towards the church, followed by a tall monk. The clock was on the stroke of twelve, the procession having drawn up within the court in front of the abbot's lodging. The prisoners were brought forth, and at sight of the abbot the whole of the monks fell on their knees. A touching sight was it to see those revered men prostrate before their ancient superior. He condemned to die, and they deprived of their monastic home, and the officer had not a heart to interfere. Deeply affected, Haslu advanced to the prior, and raising him affectionately, embraced him. After this, he addressed some words of comfort to the others, who arose as he enjoined them, and at a signal from the officers, the procession set out of the church, singing the placebo. The abbot and his fellow captives brought up the rear, with a guard on either side of them. All soul bell told all the the while. Meanwhile, an officer entered the great hall, where the Earl of Derby was feasting with the retainers, and informed him that the hour appointed for the ceremonial was close at hand. The Earl arose and went to the church, attended by Braddle and Asherton. He entered by the western porch, and proceeding to the choir, seated himself in the magnificently carved stall formerly used by Paslew, and placed where it stood a hundred years before by John Eccles, ninth abbot. Midnight struck, the great door of the church swung open, and the organ pealed for the De Profundis. The aisles were filled with armed men, but a clear space was left for the procession, which presently entered in the same order as before, and moved slowly along the transept. Those who came first thought it a dream, so strange was it to find themselves once again in the old custom church. The good prior melted into tears. At length the abbot came to him, the whole scene appeared like a vision. The lights streaming from the altar, the incense flowed in the air, the diapisons rolling overhead, the well-known faces of the brethren, the familiar aspect of the sacred edifice. All these filled him with emotion motion, too painful almost for endurance. It was the last time he should visit the holy place, the last time he should hear those solemn sounds, the last time he should behold those familiar objects. A, the last. Death could have no hang like this, and with hearts well nigh bursting, the limbs scarcely serving their office, he tottered on. Another trial awaited him, and one for which he was wholly unprepared. As he drew near the chancel, he looked down an opening on the right, which seemed purposely preserved by the guard. Why were those tapers burning? in the side chapel. What was within it? He looked again and beheld two uncovered fires. On one lay the body of a woman. He started in the beautiful but fierce features of the dead. He beheld the witch best them die. She was gone to her account for him. The maldiction he had pronounced upon her child had killed her. Paul, he turned to the other fire and recognised the ashby. He shuddered but comforted himself that he was at least guiltless of his death. Though he had a strange feeling that the forester had in some way perished for him. But his attention was diverted towards a tall monk in the Cistercian habit, standing between the bodies with a howl drawn over his face. As Hazlu gazed at him, the monk slowly raised his hood and partially disclosed features that smote the abbot as if he had beheld a spectre. Could it be? Could fancy cheat him thus? He looked again, the monk was still 
standing there, but the cowl had dropped over his face, striving to shake off the horror that possessed him. The abbot staggered forward, and reaching the presbytery, sank upon his knees. The ceremonial then commenced. A solemn requiem was sung by the choir, and three yet living heard the hymn for the repose of their souls. Always deeply impressive, the service was unusually so on this sad occasion, and the melodious voices of the singers never sounded so mournfully sweet as then. The demeanour of the prior never seemed so dignified, nor his accents so touching and solemn. The sternest hearts were softened, but Abbot found it impossible to fix his attention on the service. The lights had also burned dimly in his eyes. The loud antiphon of the solitary prayer fell upon a listless ear. His whole life was passing in review before him. He saw himself as he was when he first professed his faith, and felt the zeal and holy aspirations that filled him then. Years flew by at a glance, and he found himself so deacon. The subdeacon became deacon, and the deacon so prior, and the end of his ambition seemed plain before him. But he had a rival, his fears told him, a superior in zeal and learning, one who, through many years younger than he, had risen so rapidly in favour with the ecclesiastical authorities that he threatened to outstrip him. Even now, when the goal was full in view, the darkest passage of his life approached crime which should cast a deep shadow over the whole of his brilliant after career. He would have shunned its completion if he could in vain. It stood out more palpably than all the rest. His rival was no longer in his heart. Now he was removed, the abbot did not dare to think, but he was on forever unless the tall monk were he. Unable to endure this terrible retrospect, Haslu strove to bend his force on other things. The choir was singing the Dias Irae, and their voices thundered forth, Rex Tremendeo Majestatis, Qua Salvandos, Salvus Gratis, Salva me von Pietatis. Fain would the abbot close his ears, and hoping to stifle the remorseful pangs that seize upon his very vitals, the sharpness of servants' teeth, he strove to dwell upon the frequent and severe acts of penance he had formed, but he now found that his penitence had never been sincere and efficacious. This one damning sin obscured all his good actions, and he felt if he died unconfessed, and with a weight of guilt upon his soul, he should perish everlastingly. Again he fled from the torment of retrospection, and again heard the choir thundering for Lacrimosa dies illa, quae besurgit ex favilla, jude candus homo reus, hui ergo pars, das di jitsu domini donna es requiem. Amen, exclaimed the abbot, and bowing his head to the ground, he earnestly repeated, Pa Jesus domini donna es requiem. Then he looked up and resolved to ask for a confessor, and unburden his soul without delay. The offertory and post communion were over, the requisite in pace of words addressed to living ears were pronounced, and the mass was ended. All prepared to depart. The prior descended from the altar to embrace and take leave of the abbot, and at the same time the Earl Derby came from his soul. Has all been done to your satisfaction, John Passalou? demanded the Earl as he drew near. Oh, my good lord, replied the abbot, lowly inclining his head, and I pray you think me not importunate if I prefer one other request. I would fain have a confessor visit me, that I may lay bare my inmost heart to him, and receive absolution. I have already anticipated the request, replied the Earl, and I have provided a priest for you. He shall attend you within an hour in your own chamber. You have ample time between this and daybreak to settle your accounts with heaven, should there be ever so weightly. I trust so, my lord, replied Paslu, but I whole life is scarcely long enough for repentance, much less a few short hours. But in regard to the confessor, he continued, filled with misgiving by the Earl's manner, I should be glad to be shriven by Father Christopher Smith, late prior of the abbey. It may not be, replied the Earl, Earl, sternly and decidedly. You will find all you can require in him, I shall send. The abbot sighed, seeing that remonstrance was useless. One further question I would address to you, my lord, he said, and that refers to the place of my interment. Beneath our feet lie buried all my predecessors, abbots of Warley, here lie John Eccles, for whom was carved the soul in which your lordship hath sat, and from which I have been drawn. He arrests the learned John Lindley, fifth abbot, and beside him is immediate professor Robert de Tockley, who to 230 years ago, on the festival of St. Gregory, our canonised abbot commenced the erection of the sacred edifice above us. At that epoch were here enshrined the remains of the saintly Gregory, and here were also brought the bodies of Ilias D. Workersley and John E. Belfield, four prelates of piety and wisdom. You may read the names where you stand, my lord. You may count the graves of all the abbots. They are sixteen in number. There is one grave yet unoccupied, one stone yet unvarnished, with an effigy in brass. Well, said the Earl, Derby. When I sat in that storm,
Oh my lord, Hugh Pazalu, pointing to the abbot's chair. When I was head of this church, it was my fault to rest here among my other abbots. You have forfeited the right, replied the earl, sternly. All the abbots who thus is humbling beneath us died in the order of San Cite, loyal to their sovereigns and true to their country. Whereas you will die an attained felon and rebel, you can have no place amongst them. Concern not yourself further in the matter. I will find a bit engraver you, perchance at the foot of the gallows. And turning away, gave the signal for a general departure. Chapter 6 Tetra et Fortis Casa. Left alone and unable to pray, the abbot strove to dissipate his agitation of spirit by walking to and fro within the chamber. And while thus occupied, he was interrupted by a guard who told him that priest sent by the Earl of Derby was without and immediately afterwards the confessor was ushered in. It was the tall monk who had been standing between the buyers and his features were still shrouded by his cowl. At sight of him, Paslu sank upon a seat and buried his face in his hands. The monk offered him no consolation but waited in silence till he should again look up. At last Paslu took courage and spoke. Who and what are you? He demanded. A brother of the same order as yourself, replied the monk in deep and thrilling accents without raising his hood. And I am come to hear your confession by command of the Earl of Derby. Are you of this abbey? asked Hasley, tremblingly. I was, replied the monk in a stern tone, but the monastery is dissolved and all the brethren ejected. Your name, cried Hasley. I am not only here to answer questions, but to hear a confession, rejoined the monk. We think you of the awful situation in which you are placed, and that for many hours you must answer for the sins you have committed. You have yet time for repentance if you delay. Not you are right, father, replied the abbot. Be seated, I pray you, and listen to me, for I have much to tell. Thirty and one years ago, I was prior of this abbey. Up to that period of my life, I've been blameless, for if not wholly free from fault, I had little wherewith to reproach myself, little to fear from a merciful judge, unless it were that I indulged too strongly the desire of ruling absolutely in the house of which I was then only second. But Satan had laid a snare for me, into which I blindly fell. Among the brethren was one named Borlace Alverton, a young man of rare attainment and singular skill in the occult sciences. He had risen in favour, and at the time I speak of was elected sub prior. Go on, said the monk, it began to be whispered about within the abbey of Shu Haslow, that on the death of William Reed, then abbot, Borlis Alverton would succeed him, and then it was that bitter feeling of animosity were awakened in my breast against the sub-prior, and after many struggles I resolved upon his destruction. A wicked resolution, cried the monk, but proceed. I pondered over the means of accomplishing my purpose, resumed Haslow, and at last decided upon the cursing Alverton of sorcery and magic practices. The accusation was easy of the old studies in which he indulged, laid him open to the charge. He occupied a chamber overlooking the calder, and used to break the monastic rules by wandering forth at night upon the hills. When he was absent thus one night, accompanied by others of the brethren, I visited his chamber and examined his papers, some of which were covered with mystical figures and cabalistic characters. These papers I seized, and a watch was sent to make prisoner of Alverton on his return. Before dawn he appeared, and was instantly secured, and placed in close confinement. On the next day he was brought before the assembled conclave in the chapter house, and examined. His defence was unavailing. I charged him with the terrible crime of witchcraft, and he was found guilty. A holy throne brought from the monk, but he offered no other interruption. He was condemned to die a fearful and lingering death, sure the abbot, and it devolved on me to see the sentence carried out. And no pity for the innocent moved you, cried the monk. You had no compunction. None, replied the abbot. I rather rejoiced in the successful accomplishment of my scheme. The prey was fairly in my toils, and I would give him no chance of escape. Not to bring scandal upon the abbey, it was decided that Alverton's punishment should be secret. A wise resolve, observed the monk. Within the thickness of the dormitory walls is contrived a small, singular form dungeon. Continued the abbot, it consists of an arched cell just large enough to hold the body of a captive and permit him to stretch himself upon a straw pallet. A narrow staircase mounts upward to a grated aperture in one of the buttresses to admit air and light. Other opening is then non Tetra et fortis carcer is this style dungeon in our monastic roles, and it is well described for it is black and strong enough. Food is admitted to the miserable inmate of the cell by means of a revolving sword, but no interchange of speech can be held with those without a large sword is removed from the wall to admit the prisoner, and once immured, the masonry is mortised and made solid as before. The wretched captive does not long survive his doom, or it may be he lives too long, or death must be a release from such protracted misery. In this dark cell, one of the evil-minded brethren who essayed to stab the abbot of Kirksall in the chapter house was thrust, and ere a year was over, the provisions were untouched, and the man being known to be dead, they were saved. The skeleton was found within the cell when it was opened to admit Borlis Avelton. Poor captive, groaned the monk. A poor captive, echoed Paslu. Mine eyes have often striven to pierce those stone walls and see him lying there in that narrow chamber, or forcing his way upwards to catch a glimpse of blue sky above him. When I have seen the swallows settle on the old buttress or the 
in grass or in between the stones waving there. I have ordered him. Go on, said the monk. I scarce can proceed, rejoined Paslo. Little time was allowed Appleton for preparation. That very night, the fearful sentence was carried out. The stone was removed and a new pallet placed in the cell. At midnight, the prisoner was brought to the dormitory. The reverend chanting a doleful hymn. There he stood and missed them, his whole form towering above the rest, and his features pale as death. He protested his innocence, but he exhibited no fear. Even when he saw the terrible preparations, when all was ready, he was led to the breach. At that awful moment, his eye met mine, and I shall never forget the look. I might have saved him if I had spoken, but I would not speak. I turned away, and he was thrust into the breach. A fearful cry then rang in my ears, but it was instantly drowned by the mallets of the masons employed to blast another sword. There was a pause for a few moments, broken only by the sobs of the abbot. At length, the monks fall, and the prisoner perished in the cell. He demanded in a hollow voice, I hope so till tonight, glad that abbot, but if he escaped it, it must have been by miracle, or by aid of those powers with whom he was charged holding commence. He did escape under the monk, throwing back his hood. Look up, John Paslew, look up, false abbot, and recognise that vision. All this, Appleton, cried abbot, is it indeed you? You see, and can you doubt, replied the other, but you shall now hear how I avoided the terrible death to which you procured my condemnation. You shall now learn how I am here to repay the wrong you did me. We have changed places, John Paslew, since the night when I was rushed into the cell. Never as you ought to come forth, you are now the criminal, and I the witness of the punishment. Forgive me, or forgive me, all this. Appleton, since you are indeed he, cried the abbot, falling on his knees. Arise, John Paslew, cried over sternly. Arise and listen to me, for the damning offences into which I have been led, I hold you responsible for you, and might have died free from sin. It is fit you should know the amount of my iniquity. Give ear to me, I say, when first shut within that dungeon, I yielded to the promptings of despair. Cursing you, I threw myself on the pallet, resolved to taste no food, and hoping death would soon release me. But the love of life prevailed. On the second day, I took the bread and water allotted me, and ate and drank, after which I scaled the narrow staircase and gazed through the thin barred loophole at the bright blue sky above, sometimes catching the shadow of a bird as it flew past. Oh, how I yearned for freedom then. Oh, how I wished to break through the stone walls that held me fast. Oh, what a way to despair crushed my heart as I crept back to my narrow bed. The cell seemed like a grave, and indeed it was a little better. The horrible thought possessed me. What if I should be willfully forgotten? What if no food should be given me, and I should be left to perish by the slow pangs of hunger? At this idea, I shrieked aloud, but the walls alone returned the dull echo to my cries. I beat my hands against the stone till the blood roared from them, but no answer was returned, and at last I desisted from sheer exhaustion. Day after day, and night after night, passed in this way. My food regularly came, but I became maddened with solitude, and with terrible imprecations invoked aid from the powers of darkness to set me free. One night, while thus employed, I was startled by a mocking voice which said, All this fury is needless. Thou hast only to wish for me, and I come. It was profoundly dark. I could see nothing but a pair of red orbs glowing like flaming carbuncles. Thou wouldest be free, continued the voice. Thou shalt be so. Arise and follow me. At this I felt myself grasped by an iron arm, against which all resistance would have been unavailing, even if I had dared to offer it, and in an instant I was dragged up the narrow steps. The stone wall opened before my unseen conductor, and in another moment we were upon the roof of the dormitory. By the bright star beams shooting down from above, I discerned a tall shadowy figure standing by my side. Thou art mine, he cried, in accents graven forever on my memory, for I am a generous master, and I will give thee a long term of freedom. Thou shalt be avenged upon thine enemy, deeply avenged. Grant this, and I am thine, I replied. A spirit of internal vengeance possessed me, and I knelt before the fine. But thou must tarry for a while, he answered, for thine enemy's time will be long in coming, but it will come. I cannot work him immediate harm, but I will lead him to a height from which he will assuredly fall headlong. Thou must depart from this place, for it is perilous to thee, and if thou stayest here, I will befall thee. I will send a rat to thy dungeon, which shall daily devour the provisions, so that the monks shall not know thou hast fled. In thirty and one years shall the abbot's doom be accomplished. Two years before that time thou mayest return. Then come along to Pendle Hill on Friday night, and beat the water of the moss wall on the summit, and I will appear to thee and tell thee more. Nine and twenty years, remember. With these words, the shadowy figure melted away, and I found myself standing alone on the mossy roof of the dormitory. The cold stars were shining down upon me, and I heard the howl of the watchdogs near the gate. The fair abbe slept in beauty around me, and I gnashed my teeth with rage to think that you had made me an outcast from it, and robbed me of dignity which might have been mine. I was raw also that my vengeance should be so long delayed, but I could not remain where I was, so I chambered down the buttress and fled away. Can this be? cried the abbot, who had listened in rapt wonderment to the narration. Two years after your immurement in the cell, the food having been for some time untouched, the walls was opened, and upon the pallet was found a decayed 
carcass in mouldering monkey specimens. It was a body taken from the charnel and placed there by the demon replied the monk. On my long wanderings in other lands and beneath brighter skies, I need not tell you, but neither absence nor lapse of years cooled my desire of vengeance. And when the appointed time drew nigh, I returned to my own country and came hither in a lowly garb under the name of Nicholas M. Dyke. Ha! exclaimed the abbot. I went to Pendle Hill as director to pursue the monk and saw the dark shape there as I beheld it on the dormitory roof. All things were then told me, and I learned how the late rebellion should rise and how it should be crushed. I learned also how my vengeance should be satisfied. As Lou groaned aloud, a brief pause ensured. The deep emotion marked the essence of the wizard as he proceeded. When I came back, all this part of Lancashire resounded with praise of the beauty of Bess Lapin, a rustic lass who dwelt in Barrowford. She was called the Flower of Endel, and inflamed all the youths with love, and all the maidens with jealousy, which she favoured none except Cuthbert Ashby Forrester to the Abbot of Warley. Her mother would fain have given her to Forrester in marriage, but Bess would not be disposed of so easily. I saw her and became at once enamoured. I thought my heart was seared, but it was not so. The savage beauty of Bess pleased me more than the most refined charms could have done, and her fierce nature harmonised with my own. How I won her matters not, she cast off all thoughts of Ashby and clung to me. My wild life suited her, and she roamed the waste with me, scaled the hills in my company, and shrank not from the weird meetings I attended. I repugnantly attended her, and she became branded as a witch. Her aged mother closed the doors upon her, and those who would have gone miles to meet her now avoided her. Bess heeded this little. She was of a nature to repair the world's costumely with like scorn, but when a child was born, the case became different. She wished to save it. Then it was for sure, them died vehemently, and regarding the abbot with flashing eyes, then it was that I was again mortally injured by you. Then your ruthless decree to the clergy went forth. My child was denied baptism and became subject to the fine. Alas, alas, exclaimed Paslu, and as if this were not injury enough, thundering them died, you have called down a withering and lasting curse upon its innocent head, and through its transfixed mother's heart, if you had complied with that poor girl's request, I would have forgiven you your wrong to me and have saved you. There was a long, fearful silence. At last, Demdi advanced to the abbot and seized his arm, fixing his eyes upon him as if to search into his soul. Answer me, John Paslu, he cried, answer me, as you shall speedily answer your maker. Can that malediction be recalled? Dare not to trifle with me, or I will tear forth your black heart and cast it in your face. Can that curse be recalled? Speak, it cannot, replied the abbot, half dead with terror. Away then, thundered Demdike, casting him from him to the gallows, to the gallows, and he rushed out of the room.